I know, I know. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, can we settle down, please, and begin the session? Please take your seats, close the doors, drink the last of your coffee, etc. I must say we feel a bit like a rock band up here because the, the lights are on us and we can't really see you. So this, this must be how you two feel when they play in, in, in Belgrade Stadium. Uh, let, me, um, let me very quickly introduce myself, uh, the panel, and give you an idea of how we're going to structure this extremely important discussion, which is, is there an end to this financial crisis? And uh, what way can we get out of it, both economically and, crucially, politically? Because all, all of our solutions have to be democratically legitimate to be sustainable. Uh, my name is Hugo Brady. I'm a senior research fellow uh, at the Centre for European Reform, which is a London-based pro-European think tank, if that's possible. Uh, and we, uh, I'm actually the Brussels representative, and uh, we basically think the EU is a very good thing, but could always work better. Uh, to my immediate left, it, we're very kindly joined by the Deputy Prime Minister for European Integration, Susanna Grubzjesic. Thank God. Uh, and then again to, the, again to the left is Sinan Ulgun, who is the director of EDAM, a very reputable uh, Turkish think tank and also a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment. And then again is, is, uh, is Mr. Bruce Jackson, who's going to introduce himself later. So, uh, if I can just make some very brief introductory remarks about the economic crisis. Economists like to say that uh, there's four different, there's an, a joke amongst economists that there's four different types of economy. There's developing, there's developed, Japan, and Argentina. And uh, I think that by the end of the Eurozone crisis, uh, which we have seen fluctuate dramatically over the last few months, and which really does dictate the economic future of Europe, and probably the future of globalization in many ways, I was speaking to a few representatives of the Shanghai Institute for International Affairs during the week, and this, the Eurozone crisis is the, is the lead chip in the global political game because it affects, although Europe itself is not making the political weather, what happens in Europe happens to the global economy, and therefore everybody cares about it. Since the uh, intervention of the European Central Bank a few weeks ago, we've seen the yields on bonds, such as the Irish bonds, for example, the country I know best, have come down very, very dramatically. But at the same time, countries like Portugal and Greece seem to be slipping deeper and deeper into trouble. So nobody can figure out what's going to happen. Uh, so I think we haven't seen the end of this drama, and we need to discuss it uh, uh, in depth during this session. Uh, our panelists have all very kindly agreed to, to limit themselves to uh, uh, seven minutes, and then we will take some questions from the floor. So can I hand the floor now to, to the minister? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Brady, and I would also like to express my gratitude to the organizers, my dear friends, Ms. Sonja Licht, Maja Bobic from European Movement of Serbia, the organization from which I originally came from and enter the politics from, from the European Movement of, of Serbia. Uh, so it, it is really a challenging topic. Is there an exit out of the European crisis of economy and democracy? But I would not speak only about economic crisis because it's not only about economy. There are some other, some other crises as well, some other deficits as well. Uh, what is really threatening the stability of Europe today? Though seemingly different in roots and manifestations, crises of economy and democratic deficits in the EU are closely interconnected. Arguably, to a large extent, the current predicament could be attributed to a lacking or defunct democratic procedures, which impeded timely and effective actions of both the EU institutions and respective governments of member states aiming the looming debt crisis. At the same time, the growing dissatisfaction and economic hardship accompanied by necessary but painful austerity measures, coupled with populist rhetoric coming from extremes on both sides of the political spectrum, left and right, challenged in a new way our democratic institutions. Struggling EU nations are facing two kinds of deficits. Budgetary deficits, which deteriorate foundations of European economies and democratic deficits which undermine the social cornerstone of the European project. In economic terms, there is a clear trade-off between the two. 
It is not realistic to expect that swiftly and often hastily implemented reforms, though aimed at solidifying economic systems in dire need of restructuring, would leave the system of values for which Europe has fought over many decades intact. There is no simple way out of this crisis, but there clearly is a starting point, and that is the European Union and more of it. The EU enlargement has been one of the few success stories of the EU, proving the tremendous capacity of the Union to transform transform societies with its structural foreign policy. Even when at the times when countries of the so-called New Europe were passing through institutional crisis, as it was recently the case with Hungary and Romania, for example, the EU proved its capacity to restore the rule of law and democracy. Nevertheless, the concept of enlargement suffered even before the recession started in 2008, and we were all presented with notions of the enlargement fatigue and absorption capacity. In today's reality of growing financial uncertainty and economic challenges accompanied by perpetual questioning of decisions made in the past, it is only normal that skepticism towards accepting new member states often regarded as additional fiscal burden has re-emerged. At the same time, for everything I've mentioned so far, it is now more than ever important to show commitment to the European project and its inherent values. This commitment must be equally shared by the EU and its member states and by the aspiring candidate countries. EU officials have reportedly underlined that the future of the Western Balkans lie within the EU as long as they manage to fulfill the membership criteria. Countries of the region have displayed a commendable level of commitment to reforms and harmonization with the EU standards. Serbian government, on its part, is profoundly devoted to the country's EU future and dedicated to reforms which will primarily benefit the citizens of Serbia. And that is the crucial point for me personally. EU membership is not, cannot, and should not be the goal in itself. It should be a normal and logical consequence of a real and substantial transformation of the society. In this respect, the process of EU enlargement is indispensable, providing not only sets of reforms and best practices proven to be effective in European countries, codified in the acquis communautaire, but also a time frame and clear benchmarks for their implementation. However, communicating the EU and the process of integration has been a challenge throughout the region, not only in Serbia, with shortcomings both on the part of national authorities and the EU officials alike. On one hand, national leaders were presenting unrealistic scenarios of prompt EU accession and bidding with random dates, while at the same time blaming the EU for every unpopular but necessary reform. On the other hand, EU missed countless opportunities to properly communicate concrete benefits of the EU-sponsored projects and programs. That is why it is now in times when popular support for the enlargement both in the EU member states and the candidate countries is a rather unimpressive our responsibility as politicians is to be honest and consistent without sugarcoating the truth and without changing the rules of the game as we go. Serbian government is committed to reforms which lead to fulfilling legal, political, economic criteria for the EU accession and ultimately better life <coughs> of our citizens, as well as healthy and positive relations with our neighbors and uh, proactive participation in all regional fora. At the same time, Serbian citizens expect the EU to stay true to their commitments and appropriately reward progress made by our state and our society on our predetermined membership path. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for ending on that very confident note, uh, Minister Grubiusic. If I could uh, now hand the floor to Sinan to, to talk a little bit further about the, the economic and political aspects of the crisis. 
Thank you, Go. Uh, I may not be so successful as the minister on ending on a high note, however, and uh, I hope you allow me that liberty at the end. Um, when I received the invitation to attend the forum, uh, I accepted uh, gladly, uh, and I very much would like to thank the organizers. I spent uh, a number of my childhood years in Belgrade, and it's uh, such a uh, nice thing to come back to the city. Um, then I started to prepare for this event, and the first question that was uh, initially uh, addressed uh, to our panel was about uh, the economics of it, namely uh, how do we assess the economic situation in Europe, uh, what it has brought about. And I started to think uh, about uh, not only what has been uh, written about the economic crisis in Europe, and there are large volumes that have been written over it, but really, how do you link the economics of it to the politics of the region? And that's uh, basically what I will try to do. Uh, I want to start with how I frame this problem. It's essentially uh, a problem of competitiveness for Europe. And it's a problem of uh, twin competitiveness. One is a competitiveness among uh, the EU or between the EU and the rest of the world. And the other one, and perhaps the more insidious one, one that we have been blinded to, is a problem of competitiveness between the EU member states between the North uh, and the South. Um, and we see this clearly uh, with one very visible uh, parameter, and that is the size of the current account deficits. Uh, what we have seen after the, uh, after the Euro is a burgeoning trade deficit between the North and the South, uh, with the trade balance of the periphery countries uh, getting, uh, moving uh, in the red uh, more and more. So the question that, you know, when an economist looks at the situation, ask is basically how will those southern countries, the periphery countries, regain their competitiveness? Again, not only vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, but vis-a-vis -vis the north of Europe, vis-a-vis -vis Germany in particular. And the textbook answer to that, you know, critical question is essentially an exchange rate devaluation, fiscal discipline, and structural reform. That is what you read in the economic textbooks. That is what a number of IMF delegations try to impose across the world uh, to the countries that have witnessed such a loss in, uh, in competitiveness. Now, for the Eurozone, obviously, uh, one of those conditions or one of those policy instruments is not available. Namely, the Euro countries cannot devalue their currency, uh, so they cannot, uh, through devaluation, uh, regain competitiveness. And therefore, we have to think about other policy measures uh, that will help uh, the type of internal devaluation uh, to, uh, to, to evolve. Now, in the past, there are a number of different success stories within the EU. Germany is one. When we look at the German success story, this is a country that has moved in about a decade uh, from a negative uh, current account uh, to a very positive one. Germany today is the largest exporter in the world in absolute terms. Uh, and this is mainly due to the reforms, the structural reforms that were undertaken during the uh, Schroeder area. Now, Germany may not be a very good blueprint for the countries uh, because it's a large economy, uh, but many of those countries, the periphery countries, Spain, Portugal, uh, Spain to some extent, but Portugal, Greece, uh, are certainly smaller economies. So, but there are other examples, like, like Latvia, for instance, which after the severe contraction in 2008 was able to, to rebound. And there are clear recommendations that come out of, the, uh, of these crises. So, there are four fundamental factors, uh, recommendations, uh, for an inter in internal devaluation to succeed, uh, to pull back a country from uh, a decline in competitiveness. Uh, I'll name those four, but I will focus on the last one, which was because that's where I think the, political, the politics of it are much more interesting. Uh, the first one is the, that the economy in question needs to be small and open. The second one is that it needs to have flexible labor markets. The third one is that it has to have trade partners that do well. And the fourth one is that it needs 
to be willing to put up with a loss of output and employment. Now, what that means in the more simpler terms is that societies should accept a loss in their real income, a loss in their standard of living. That is the policy prescription uh, for uh, regaining competitiveness. Now, when you, when you stop here and think about what that means in political terms, it essentially means that the countries that today are at the forefront of the economic crisis, the periphery countries, need to be able politically to deal with the consequences of such a difficult outcome. Namely, they need to understand and they need to internalize this, the fact that their short-term, if not mid-term future, will be worse, not to say much worse, than their recent past. What this does is essentially, this is a test about the strength of domestic institutions. And this is a test for the institutions that I will categorize under internal conflict management. I'm not talking here about ethnical conflicts, which is something that we talked about last night in a different panel. This is about internal conflict management about the distribution of costs in, in a given society. Uh, how are these costs going to be measured? How are they going to be distributed among the different members of society? Among the government, among the trade unions, uh, among capital owners, uh, among workers. This is fundamentally how society will be able to deal with this distribution of costs. And there's an interesting literature that sheds light on this. This is a literature that was developed years before on a different topic, which I think is nonetheless very relevant for the topic that we're discussing. Again, harking back to economic theory, there's literature about, uh, this was initial literature developed to understand how societies benefit from trade liberalization. Uh, and it essentially came into being in order to allow a better understanding on which countries deal better with globalization, which countries benefited from globalization, and which countries benefited, therefore, for, by trade liberalization. And the, the, the answer that was developed in that literature, particularly by people like Danny Roderick, was that they were arguing that the countries that benefited from globalization that benefited from trade liberalization were the countries that were able to nurture the type of internal conflict management institutions that allowed a society to come to grips and to solve these problems of the distribution of costs. Uh, and for countries that had reached this level of institutional maturity, uh, trade liberalization proved to be uh, positively related to growth and the countries that lack these institutions, the outcome of trade liberalization was a much, much more mixed outcome. Now, the analogy with the periphery countries, with the southern countries uh, in, in Europe that face the burden of adjustment today, I think is very clear. So when you start to peel back the different layers of the economic crisis in Europe today, you find that the inner layer is not about Europe. The inner layer is about the strength and the maturity of the institutions of democratic governance. And this is really a test about the maturity and the strength of these institutions. And I use, and I use the term institutions in the large sense. It is about governments. It is about political parties. It is about the media. It's about all the platforms that create the interaction between these different uh, social stakeholders. It is inherently political. It is not economic. There is no technical answer. There is no economic answer to the current crisis that we are facing. It is an inherently political challenge, and we definitely need a political answer. And the second outcome of this analysis, if you are with me, is that Europe in itself and by itself will not be able to provide the answer. 
it can only provide breathing room. The answer will need, will need to be designed and implemented at the domestic level uh, if we believe that this is really a crisis about institutions. Um, now, I talked at great length about the burden of adjustment that falls on the southern countries. Now, the northern countries also have to share some of this burden through possibly higher inflation, higher wages, uh, so that they can help this adjustment, this costly adjustment in the south. But fundamentally, and here's where I want to end, is we are facing a race. There's a deadline. Uh, there's a deadline for adjustment. Uh, it's going to be increasingly difficult for the governments that are now undergoing this crisis to sustain the legitimacy of their system if they cannot start to improve the conditions of their citizens. And this can become a threat to democracy. Uh, I think we don't need to go very far down the pages of history to understand how much of a threat this can represent even uh, in a continent uh, like Europe. Um, I agree with Hugo. I think we certainly have not seen the end of this drama. Uh, and uh, we have to look at the real dynamics behind the crisis, try to peel the different layers, and, I'll, and when I peel those different layers, what I face is really a crisis about domestic governance. And this is where we should focus uh, more so than what we can do at the European level. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Sinan. And I suspect a question we'll come back to later is uh, that a small country like Latvia can make a 17% adjustment, but ask a country like Spain to do that. Uh, the larger countries are less maneuverable, and uh, the, therefore the political and democratic questions are even larger. Could I move on to, to Bruce Jackson now, the president of the Project on Transitional Democracies? Bruce, you'll give us, no doubt, also a transatlantic view on this. Well, I wouldn't call it a transatlantic view, but uh, the topic is the financial and democratic crisis in Europe, and I think I'm going to argue it is not, that that is not what's happening, and I'll just to have some respectability for this argument, I'll cite Ivan Krestov, a great thinker from the region here, who is writing extensively on, about this. First, I don't think we have a crisis of democracy. I think what's going on in Europe is kind of a political air sickness, which is something that occurs when liberal goals are contradicted by democratic mechanisms. What is happening in Brussels is liberals want to reform the EU with federalism, and the Democrats elsewhere in Europe want to limit uh, federalism in order to, to free electorates to vote for nationalism, populism, or, some, or, or government by referendum. That is per perhaps a contradiction of political imagination, but it is not a failure of European institutions. It may be unpleasant, but it's not a crisis. Secondly, it's hardly a financial crisis. Uh, we have always thought that liberalism and capitalism went together and they were intertwined. The last major change in Europe in 1989 brought people who were democratic, anti-communist, and firmly capitalistic into Europe. Today, a democrat in Greece or Spain or France is probably an anti-capitalist. It's kind of hard to have an integrated European market if you want to be based on anti-capitalist goals a very strange outcome. But this is really not a financial crisis. A financial crisis is where you can't pay your debts. A financial crisis is not when you don't want to pay your debts or want to have certain condition, conditions and certain banking re regimes. It is a discussion of conditions and process, not uh, insolvency. Thirdly, we all talk about the disillusion voters have with uh, European democracy, that this is a very great change. It seems to me that the generation that's grown up in Europe has grown up in 60 years of unparalleled prosperity beginning in the immediate post-war up until 2008. We don't have anybody living today that has a, as a, as a political memory of the 1930s. But one should note that disillusionment, depression, even despair is the zeitgeist of any global recession. And we are, we are in a global recession. I don't think the EU caused that. It's possible that the economic conditions themselves caused that. Finally, there's the argument that Europe has, that we are unique. The financial crisis is unique to Europe, and these debates are unique to Europe. Well, as an American, that doesn't seem to be true. 
Americans say that they're disillusioned with their government. Occupy Wall Street rejects capitalism, too. The Tea Party rejects the federal government in Washington. Obama supports the federal state, but Romney supports the devolution to member states. Uh, it's all about the financial crisis in America and whether we should take money from rich people on Wall Street, which I think you call Germany on this side of the Atlantic, and give it to what Romney unfortunately calls the 47%, bad term, which I think you call either pigs or southern Europe uh, in this side of the Atlantic. It's the same debate. And so there may be a financial crisis in Europe, but it's not original and it's not unique to this side of the Atlantic. What I think is going on, is, and particularly important to, to reinforce and underline in uh, Serbia, the EU remains the most ambitious and large its project in constitutional democracy to occur since the American Revolution 250 years ago. On historical terms, it's been amazingly successful. Uh, it's, there's no taking that away from it. What has happened is it has hit its federal moment uh, about 50 years later than we did in our period. It's undoubtedly going to result in greater banking federalism, but not just that. Obviously, it's going to, there's going to be a federalization of the energy portfolio, which is a trillion-dollar project looking Europe in the face. Competition is, it will, will have to reconcile. And I think what you're seeing in the EADS, BAE discussions is the glimmer of federal approaches towards defense, which may come many years from now. I think where I disagree with Ivan Krest is I don't think that there's a danger of paralysis or disintegration at the center of the European political experiment. I think it is just as likely that within two years the EU and the United States will succeed in negotiating an Atlantic free trade uh, pact, which will create an integrated <coughs> or free trade market, which will con uh, contain 50% of the entire wealth on the face of the planet, which is around $33 trillion annually.
The current measures are acceptable, but still not enough. But it, they, are, they are more optimistic that a political solution will be found. And you can sort of hear that in Sinan's remarks. I think that you, you, very, uh, you gave us a great dichotomy between the economic analysis and the political analysis. Because fundamentally, I agree with Sinan, the solutions to the crisis do have to be political. And furthermore, they have to be in some way democratically sustainable. Because most people think that some mutualization of debt has to be uh, a, part of the, a, a part of the eventual solution. The problem with that is, is that when you, governments start issuing mutual debt, they are essentially having the same budget, and that requires having the same treasury, and that again requires a political union. None of this would be as serious if the institutions in Brussels were a bit stronger than they perhaps are. The European Commission has lost some authority in recent years and ha is not really at the center of actions to manage the crisis. Although by the end of the year, the Europeans will, we think, have agreed a, a, a banking union, which the Commission is in charge of designing. So that's given it back some political legitimacy. Uh, however, the European Parliament, the only multinational directly elected parliament in the world, is not a body which would be seen in the rest of Europe as, as incredibly democratically legitimate, simply because voters' uh, turnout has decreased at every election since direct elections were introduced in 1979. So it's very difficult to see the future of the, the European Parliament as the democratic answer, the democratic sticking plaster that we're going to, we're going to put on this solution to this crisis to make it sustainable. Uh, then, of course, you have, and this is the first question I'm going to ask uh, uh, Minister Grubiasic, which is, you have countries outside the EU and indeed countries who are not in the euro. What will the solution to this crisis mean for existing EU members and candidate countries who wish to join the euro or perhaps don't until the crisis is resolved? But uh, currently, they will have to make huge changes, much, much larger than the, the ones they already have to make for EU membership. These countries will have to basically have a common budgetary policy with the rest of Europe. Well, that's a lot of sovereignty to give up overnight. Uh, countries like Latvia, for example, do intend to join the euro next year. And countries like Poland, the largest and most important of the newer countries, is sort of scratching its head and saying, you know, we do want to join. It's a bit like St. Augustine, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. They, they do want to join, but of course they're also a bit nervous. And the Germans are putting a lot of pressure on them to join the euro, especially if Greece suddenly leaves the currency. If Greece becomes the first country to leave the currency, economists predict a massive attack on the euro, which could kill it. However, if Poland were to join immediately, you'd have the exit of one country, which nobody has much hope for at the moment, and the entry of a fast-growing country, which everyone sees a lot of potential for. So there's this, uh, there's this uh, a big question hanging over us, is what will be the political and economic fallout from the exit of Greece if that happens? Personally, I hope Greece does not f end up leaving the union, or leaving, leaving the currency. Uh, and the, the last question is, uh, is, is the position of Germany in all this. Germany is, the, is now, the, for the first time in European history, uh, or in, in the EU's history, the, the most important country economically. And it has always basically uh, used its economic policy uh, for its, its uh, it's always advanced its economic goals, but preferred not to have a foreign policy. We all remember, for example, that the Germans didn't want to play any role in Libya. The Germans don't want an expansive foreign policy. Their history teaches them that when Germany leads, bad things happen to Germany. So how can Germany take a credible role to agree to be a benign hegemon, uh, and how comfortably can it fit into that role? Because as surely as night follows day, that role will involve them developing a greater diplomatic presence in the world, a greater security presence. The two, thi the two things follow each other. Uh, so all of these questions face us at, the, at the, what I believe is the, the beginning of the most critical phase of the Eurozone crisis. And what happens in the Eurozone will affect all of Europe, and what happens to Europe will affect the world. So on that basis, we begin our discussion. And the first question I would like to, to address uh, uh, to the minister would be, how does this look from your perspective, from the outside looking in? Uh, is Euro membership uh, you know, everything that, uh, that, that it once was, perhaps for your country, for example? Well, we are aware here of the, uh, of the consequences of the economic crisis, which has started even before it started officially uh, elsewhere in, in the world. And uh, the previous and the present government were trying to, to cope with the effects of the crisis, uh, which were enormous to, to our economy. And first of all, uh, our standard of living is, is low. You, everybody, sh especially if you're a politician, should be aware of that fact that with the average salary of less than 400 euros, 
Uh, you cannot get uh, huge support for some unpopular measures, especially austerity measures, if you are uh, willing to uh, reform the financial sector to, to in, or to consolidate the fiscal fiscal uh, policy in, in, in uh, Serbia. Uh, what are the consequences of the crisis? Our, although low level of productivity has become even lower. Uh, unemployment rate, which was high before, now it's even higher. It's around 25%. So it's a huge burden for any, any government in the world to, to have 25% unemployment rate of, uh, within the country. Uh, many structural, structural reforms, and I don't want to sound like an IMF employee, but yes, structural reforms uh, have been left uh, aside and uh, nobody has dared to, to uh, dig deep into structural reforms in this country. But sooner or later, th this needs to, to be done. Particularly vulner vulnerable is our pension system and uh, uh, the wish of all uh, politicians to, to keep the pensions as high as they are now at the level of the 70% of an average salary, which in the long run is not sustainable. Everybody knows that that's the basic of economy, but due to political reasons, you cannot intervene uh, really with, with the cuts of pensions and, and uh, salaries. Instead of uh, uh, freezing them, uh, uh, the government will allow for the salaries in public sector and pensions to rise by 2%, but having in mind the inflation rate of over 10% with uh, likely 12% by, by the spring next year, the, salaries in public sector and pensions will be actually frozen or or uh, will be actually will will actually decrease in, in but these are only short term measures until until the end of this year uh, but the budget deficit is close to 7% 6.7 the aim is to reduce it uh, next year so to half it actually, to, to uh, get to the level of 3.5 percent, which is uh, which is ambitious, and which will require un unpopular measures. It's not about uh, savings and expend expenditures only, but it's about, as uh, Mr. Mr. Ulgen said, it's about the lack of competitiveness of our economy. It's about our uh, low, low base, low productivity, and it, it's about our, our weak, uh, weak public sector and weak private sector. Yeah. So when you combine these two weaknesses, we, we get what we, what we have now. Uh, the crisis uh, was also an excuse for, for all the bad that has happened here in economic terms, uh, I thought that the crisis would be used to uh, really uh, do some, some reforms as, as, a, as a good excuse, but the crisis on the other hand was excused not to do anything. So the crisis is here and it will stay for a while. I'm pretty sure. I'd like to abuse my position of, as chair just to ask a question briefly to each candidate or each speaker. Sinan, I would like to pick up on something you said, which was you pointed out how Germany had been the sort of good pupil and had made uh, its own reforms uh, years ago and uh, fixed its own economy, became the export meister, became briefly the world's largest exporter. But I think you, you neglected to mention that Germany itself broke the, the rules of the euro in order to cushion its own, uh, those structural reforms. The problem I see it in the, in the eurozone crisis is the answer to everything is structural reforms. 
But structural reforms take 10 years to kick in. Uh, what, what are our voters going to do? You know, go into cryo freeze until uh, wake up in a, in a, in a happy 2020. Uh, so what, what, what do you see is the, the problem I'm trying to point out here is there's a problem of rules. Uh, there has to be some flexibility for the countries we're asking to make such sharp adjustments. So what, is, there, is there an answer there somehow? And if you, if you like, uh, you can either now or later comment on how things look from the Turkish side looking into the EU. Uh, second part of your question to follow up on the uh, minister's uh, statements, how things look uh, from uh, countries that are negotiating uh, their accession. Um, and there are two dimensions to that. One is that the EU's image has been incredibly tarnished. Um, when I go out in Turkey in public fora, universities, and speak about the EU, um, Already, it didn't have a particularly good image because Turks were generally frustrated with the experience with the EU. But now it's, in a way, uh, a relief to some of my citizens saying, look, they were saying no to us, uh, arguing that you know, we were not at the economic standard for joining the EU, and look at what's happening to them. Uh, but if you go beyond this, you know, perhaps uh, instinctive reaction, uh, you realize that uh, the EU's image has been greatly handicapped by the economic crisis. The EU is seen not so much anymore as part of the solution, but itself part of the problem. And that obviously shapes thinking about EU accession. Uh, many more people are vocal, saying, you know, why do we need the EU? Why should we join a sinking ship? Now, I don't particularly believe that the EU is a sinking ship. I think that, you know, the EU will certainly find uh, the, uh, the solution to this crisis and possibly emerge from this crisis uh, in, you know, becoming a stronger entity. Uh, we can discuss what sort of EU will emerge, and I think that's also a very interesting discussion. It will not be the EU of your mother. It's not going to be, it's certainly going to be a different EU. We can talk about multi-tier, we can talk about concentric circles, we can talk about the EU without the UK, which may also be a possibility. Hugo, you may want to comment on that one. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this is the prevailing sentiment. And I think it's becoming much more difficult for a government intent at least paying lip service to EU accession to push EU-linked reforms in this environment. And I certainly would like to hear your views about how you know, the politics of it play out in, in, in Serbia. But uh, that's at least you know, the, the politics of, of this, uh, or the impact of this crisis on a country like Turkey that is actually negotiating accession. It's becoming increasingly more difficult to convince large segments of the population that EU accession is a good thing for Turkey. That's where we stand. Now, coming back to your question about uh, the economics uh, is, um, well, certainly, I mean, what we have seen, uh, the debate evolving in the EU, initially it was very much about austerity. It was very much about enforcing fiscal discipline. It was very much about saving to compensate for the past sins uh, of the southern countries. Uh, now there's a more mature discussion. Uh, I think France has had a positive influence in all of this, bringing on board the second dimension, which I think is indispensable, and that is growth. You cannot discuss what's going on within Europe, and you cannot really paint uh, a good future for Europe if you don't discuss prospects for growth, if you just restrain yourself to austerity, uh, the outcome of it will, at, at least I believe, will be uh, a much more difficult future for all, for all of Europe. So I think the, the, uh, the fact of bringing growth into the discussion and basically trying to find a balance between these two possibly competing objectives, austerity and growth, is, is where we are today. Uh, and I think this is, a, you know, this is really the core of the issue. Uh, there's no easy answer to it. Uh, and, but uh, I think now the EU institutions at least 
and, and Germany uh, with the, you know, with Merkel moving its position uh, is at least trying to buy enough time uh, to prevent a degeneration of this crisis, to give enough room for national politicians and for the EU to start to find the answers to this delicate balance between austerity and growth. Okay, thank you, those excellent comments, and that will open up the discussion later uh, beautifully. Bruce, you, uh, you made some fantastic remarks, which I enjoyed, including the, the political air sickness, which I wrote down word for word, because that's, uh, I think I'll use that myself at some point. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you specifically was, uh, you say that this is not the crisis we, we, in the dialogue, the narrative on this crisis just isn't correct in many ways, that people see it as a, a crisis in our institutions. And I agree with you, the, the, the strange inertia of the political centre is directly uh, contradictory to the usual narratives about the rise of the far right in Europe, for example, something that we're obsessed by, and notwithstanding the, the rise of groups like Golden Dawn in Greece. But if you say that this is not really the, the existential crisis, or at least not the kind of existential crisis we thought it was, how long do you think the crisis can actually go on like this? Because, to my mind, we have... We have national uh, governments who can't do the reforms that, that they are being pressed to. We have a, a federal, confederal structure, the EU, which doesn't work the way it should. And in the middle, nothing gets done. Uh, so I, I, I can't really see uh, how long we can go on like this without something breaking. Uh, that's a difficult question. Sure. Uh, Look, it, it seems to me that the rise of the populism and nationalism is, is a little bit of a confusion between representational democracy and democracy every hour. I mean, we, that's not what's on offer. Uh, actually, we only get to vote once every four years, and then you're stuck with uh, I, President Obama, for, from my perspective. Uh, it, it's not something we get to re, you know, review every day or vote on everything coming out of Brussels or Washington. <laughs> So that is, will take political courage for the Europeans to uh, explain. Uh, I would like to sort of quibble with your opening remarks, uh, Mr. Chairman. It seems to me that Europeans have the wonderful ability to basically look at things in theory. And if, it, if uh, budgets lead to that, leads to central banks, leads to political union, it all happens tomorrow. Uh, yes, well, it works in, that's how it works in theory, but that's not how it works in practice. If you look at federalism in the United States, Hamilton was 1789. It took us a century to get to antitrust. We didn't get to social, uh, pensions until another two or three decades. We finally got to highways in 1958. And we have not yet gotten to health care. Uh, so you only federalize what you must federalize. And frankly, it's, it, would, it would seem to me that a federalization of Europe uh, is not going to impinge on what most people do in France or, or Greece um, any time in a century. I mean, banking does have to be because, it's, and frankly, that's where Hamilton began. Um, I was also struck by the minister's comment, which I think is extremely true, uh, that Serbia and other aspirin countries are non-competitive uh, at the moment, and the further east you go, the more non-competitive they are. But let's just look at you know Serbia. Well, I wonder how this happened. Well, we had four wars. When I used to come here all the time, every single businessman in Serbia was on a visa ban in the United St States. They couldn't get to markets for more than a decade. Uh, for, for the better part of the last 20 years, Serbia has been under some form of containment or isolation from the major markets and institutions and banks of Europe. It seems to me there's a very simple solution to that, which is as rapid as integration as we can in, into uh, the European uh, market and the Euro-Atlantic market and an end of any kind of obstruction to the mobility of, of capital and labor. Um, and I remember when basically there were fines of Austria for uh, Serbian students to basically make it harder for them to study in Europe's universities. All that has to come to an end, and frankly, Minister, this is your portfolio. And so I hope we, we, we move as quickly as possible to the starting line of the discussion of European integration. Okay. Okay, I think we've been having a conversation between ourselves for too long now, so let's begin. And uh, if I could ask you, uh, we'll go to the floor. When you speak, if you're, comment is, or if you're making a, a question, please address the whole panel if you can. If it's a comment, please keep it to uh, a minute, minute and a half maximum, and please introduce yourself as well. So let me see. I've got, there's loads of people. This is, someone's waving two hands over here, so uh, I think uh, that's obviously Keen. Hello. Good. Um, 
My name is uh, Tim Judah. I'm the Balkans correspondent of The Economist. Um, I think I would like to, I would like to pick up on something that uh, um, Sinan has mentioned, but I think it actually deserves uh, quite a lot more serious uh, looking at, which is the possibility of a British exit from the EU. And I'd be interested to see, to, to hear your opinions on uh, what would be the possible impact. I mean, how would the EU look uh, 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 after a, a British exit, for example, from, from Belgrade, from Ankara, from, uh, uh, from uh, Washington? And um, maybe you'd like to sort of talk about the possibility of that. And also, since we're uh, about it, uh, the possibility of the dissolution of the UK with the possibility of Scotland remaining in the EU. Um, how would that look? Uh, how would that change the geopolitical uh, map and how it looks uh, from from, uh, from Belgrade, from Ankara, and from Washington. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, that's one. We'll take a set of three. This gentleman here. Um, hello, uh, my name is Dimitar Bechev. I'm the head of the uh, European Council for Foreign Relations Office in Sofia. So I'm probably s replacing my colleague, Ulrike. Um, I just wanted to press the panelists to comment about the impact of the crisis in the Eurozone on this region. Uh, because we have seen uh, how the contagion has come uh, to these uh, geographic latitudes. And through the banking system, I mean, you just look at the percentage of Greek presence. Uh, also, Slovenia is not doing um, so greatly in the banking sector. Italian banks, you can comment on. Um, and just to be the devil's advocate, isn't it the, the case that um, Europe has become part of the problem? We, I just recently wrote uh, a brief for ECFR playing with this argument it might not necessarily be so, but this instability uh, that is imported through the turbulence in the Eurozone, what is the fallout on the region and how do we get um, from here in, in the Western Balkans? Thanks. Third question. Uh, this lady here. Hi, my name is Milada Vahudava. I'm a professor of European politics at UNC Chapel Hill. And my question is for uh, Minister Grubiesic. Um, I think many of us are wondering if perhaps you could shed some light on how the policies of the current Serbian government towards European integration uh, are different or will be different than the policies of the previous government. Will be, there be a different in emphasis, more attention to economic reforms. If you could shed some light on that, thank you. Okay, fine. Uh, can we take those questions as they were in order and the panelists who were directly asked to comment, comment please. So Sina, I guess that's you first. I'll start with this you know, fascinating question about the UK exit from Europe. And I'll try to be provocative. You essentially ask me how that would be viewed from you know, where we stand. Uh, initially, my reaction would be that, you know, if such an eventuality were to occur, that would uh, greatly reduce uh, the, uh, the EU's uh, ability uh, in many domains, uh, in economic, in trade, uh, in, uh, in foreign policy, in defense. Uh, so it would certainly harm uh, the EU. Uh, that would be the initial uh, sort of reaction, looking from outside. But then there's another dimension to uh, the UK exit, which uh, we are starting to elaborate on. And that is what sort of relationship the UK will establish with Europe if it were to leave the EU. And I think the reason why that is an interesting, uh, at this point, philosophical discussion uh, hoping that it will always remain a philosophical discussion, is that that relationship could indeed be a model for a country like Turkey that has faced a number of uh, political impediments to its accession. In many ways, from that perspective, the relationship that London will establish with Brussels is of enormous interest to us provided that it is, and we believe that it is going to be a mutually beneficiary relationship. Uh, uh, it's not going to be a, a relationship, you know, cast in membership, uh, but nonetheless trying to think outside the box and see what sort of relationship that will be, which, what will be the components, what will be its governance structure, 
Where it, whether it's going to be in any way different from the relationship between you know, the European Economic Area countries or Switzerland, which is also incidentally an EEA country, uh, or between the EU and its quote-unquote strategic partners, uh, that exact model, the paradigm of the UK's relationship with Europe, if UK were to exit the EU, would I think be a very interesting example for a country like Turkey. Okay, uh, does anyone else want to comment on the British question? I can say one word because Sina and told me to. Uh, Bruce, you first. No, no, you first. Uh, of all the mistakes and uh, sins of American conservatism, we have done nothing to deserve the British Tories. Uh, it, uh, it's not possible for our ally to be as, as stupid as to leave the European Union. It would undoubtedly create a huge breach with the United States. Yeah, that's uh, emphatic. Of course, Minister. Yeah. I was last year in the House of Commons and I met not EU skeptics in some Tory MPs, but EU haters. So I was really surprised what I, what I heard from them. And given that my party has good relations with the British Conservative Party, I hope that they are just minor group and that they will not prevail within the Conservative Party itself. But I was really extremely surprised. I came not as a Euro fanatic, but as Euro realist from an inspiring country, candidate country, but I just hated it. So hopefully it will stay on a verbal level. I think the key question here is what, what does life in the European Union look like in the future for a non-Euro country? Uh, some, some two countries have formal opt-outs from, uh, from the Euro, uh, Britain and Sweden, which is supposed to try and join. Uh, but uh, what, you're seeing this two-tier Europe emerging. One way or the other, it, it's, I, I sort of lean towards Sinan's view that it is likely, in fact, probably even desirable, that the, the 17 Euro countries, 17 plus, do become more tightly integrated in order to secure the future of the common currency. Uh, but Britain simply will not be a part of that. Uh, so how, how actually that works out, whether there's going to be this European outer tier uh, bolstered by the presence of a large, important country like Britain, perhaps that will be better uh, because you have a, the, we don't want the outer tier to become this forgotten wasteland. I mean, it has to be a vital part, a vital political organisation, but the, the issue is who's going to be in it, who will want to stay there, and uh, uh, you know, which countries will, will choose the whether it's safer or not to join the common currency, and how that will develop in, would the euro area develop its own institutions, its own parliament, its own foreign policy? Uh, would there be a two-tier Europe or two different organizations in the European Union? So it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to see what will happen. But briefly on the, on the, the issue of Scottish independence, I mean, I honestly uh, find it hard to believe that the Scottish will ever actually go as far as leaving the UK, and I certainly find it hard to believe that they'll swap one unsuitable currency union, which is the pound, for another unsuitable currency union, which is the euro, uh, because they're so in, inextricably linked with the rest of Britain. Uh, but perhaps I don't have a, comment, a right to comment on that because I'm actually Irish. So, uh, the, the, the next question we have to take is Dimitri's uh, question as to the impact of the euro crisis on this region, because I imagine, and it's a very good point, because you need your trading partner to be growing fast for you to grow fast. So... Perhaps, Minister, I could ask you to, to feel that one. Yes, I, I said, what, what's the impact to, to Serbia? <laughs> this uh, goes as well to, to other countries in the region. More or less, we, we are, uh, we, with the exception maybe of, of more advanced Croatia, but uh, the rest of us, we are basically in the same pot. We, we really feel the hardships of economic crisis. And uh, we don't see uh, that we can ourselves pull from the crisis, with, that we can pull from the crisis by ourselves without an outside help. Yes, this is 2012 years, but we still need this, not aid, but rather, how could I call it, cooperation with the, or assistance from, from, from the outside to, to, to cope with the crisis. And, uh, uh, Serbia has the uh, surplus in trade with the countries in region only. That goes uh, uh, as an as argument for our low competitiveness. We cannot export much elsewhere, but within the region, within the SEFTA, 
we we have surplus uh, surplus in trade uh, we, with our neighbors with um, um, former Yugoslav republics and few few other countries as well but uh, as a region southeast europe it was hit hard really by the crisis so i don't have recipe for for the exit not yet Bruce, do you have, you have a comment? Yeah, on this um, the question of these non-competitive uh, economies coming into the EU, it turns out that uh, a lot of the effects, EU effects come, come before membership, once you just signal membership. The uh, real estate prices in Croatia and, say, Dubrovnik went up 1,000% in the decade before they came in. Uh, all the d deals uh, for U.S. steel, et cetera, in Slovakia came in in anticipation. Uh, so you get a jobs effect, a labor mobility effect uh, in sort of DCFTA, which is a sort of uh, a, a small sliver of EU that's being offered to the Eastern partners. That affects industries uh, very early on. More uh, advanced uh, things that would occur in a currency environment are certainly delayed effects, and some of them you don't want too early because they'll be disruptive uh, and could destate. I mean, if you compete directly against Daimler in making cars, that's, you're not going to win. And so they're, they're do, you do need some protections to uh, avoid uh, labor dislocations and uh, loss of businesses. But by and large, the, uh, a great, the problem with Croatia is they got almost all the benefits of the EU before they even got in. So uh, I, I don't think that that's a big worry, that we'll see a lot of the good things come in in advance in the 10 years of, of negotiation, and the, those really long poles in the tent uh, are well in the future. Of course, yes, and uh, also the next question is to you the, as well. So, the, the banking sector in Serbia proved to be solid and stable during the crisis. We didn't have any uh, any banks closed or savings withdrawn from from the banks. We didn't have any bailouts until recently, unfortunately. So, you are all familiar familiar with case of Agrobanka, which has collapsed and the consequences of its collapse are now visible more, more than it was visible before. But that proves that one reform in our country was done correctly, the reform of the banking sector, at least. Uh, Tsinan, you want to come in on that? Yeah, a few things to Dimo's question. Uh, Dimo, I think that on the banking side, if I have to start there, the worst has been staved off. Have, have been staved off. Uh, namely, what we were fearing initially was that uh, with the financial crisis in Europe, there would be a decapitalization of the uh, branches in, in the Western Balkans, leading to a credit crunch in the markets. That hasn't happened. So I think we are on, uh, on more solid ground there. Um, however, going forward, and we discussed this uh, in terms of the impact on the Eurozone, but a Grexit, which is the Greek exit from the Euro, would have significant negative consequences for the economies of this region. And the reason is uh, that with such an event occurring, the most likely reaction globally will be an increase in risk aversion a severe shortfall in financial flows, uh, a rise in the cost of capital, uh, and all of these markets, all of these states uh, need uh, capital to grow. And some of the growth models are actually predicated on the availability of cheap international capital. So if a Greek exit from Euro to occur, depending on how long it would take for international markets uh, to come back to their level of, uh, of risk uh, before a Greek exit, this would have enormous consequences and negative consequences for the economies of the region. Anybody else want to make a, a comment? Because I'm afraid we're going to have to close uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Yeah. In fact, I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in keeping in, on time, and this session actually started a half an hour later than, uh, than it was supposed to. So we've run out of time. But I have been asked to announce a lunch hour discussion called Mission Possible, How Can a Civil Society Organization Influence SSR in a Country in Transition, which will be held in the Kelmegdon Kel Room, uh, and on the occasion of the 15th anniversary of the Belgrade Centre for Security Policy, 
one of the co-founders and organizers of the BSF, uh, BSF will host an informal panel on how to use the Serbian experience in addressing challenges that civil society faces in addressing SSR in other democratizing and post-conflict countries. So I guess that's like the uh, policy version of going to a matinee uh, for lunch. Uh, I'd like to thank our panel very much for, I thought, it was a really intelligent discussion. Of course, impossible to fully encapsulate those, is, those questions in an hour, but I certainly learned a lot, and it was a great pleasure uh, to, to, to hear you and to moderate you, and also to, to have some questions from the floor. I'm sure the discussion will continue throughout the course of the day. So please give the panel a round of applause. And enjoy your lunch. <laughs>